we are going to be focusing on two sessions, right? Um, that that is on direct routing, right? So we looked at what is direct routing and when to use it. That's what we used yesterday. And today on our first session, we are going to talk about configuring direct routing. And then also we are going to have managing direct routing. That's going to be this session. And then the next session, I'm going to talk about migrating to direct routing. And that migration, obviously, you can migrate from any place, right? You can, um, but in our, uh, for our all intensive purposes, we are going to be doing migration from Sky for Business to, to Microsoft Teams direct routing. So let's get started. So the configuration steps for direct routing uh, is what you see on the slide, right? So you're going to start. Let me get my pointer. Uh, you're going to start by configuring the SBC, and we discussed this in great depth. Yesterday, we talked about the correct FKDNs that you can put in or the correct domain that you can choose, and the FKDN is up to you what you want to create. Uh, the, the certificate that you need, the subject name that you need, uh, for that TLS uh, connection to be supported, and then also the firewall ports uh, and protocols that you need to allow, depending upon which cloud the tenant is homed on, whether they're homed on just the commercial cloud, GCC high cloud, DOD cloud, then some of the parameters are different in the sense for the firewall ports. And if you need to lock it down by specific subnets for the transport relays and media processors, then you uh, the, the, those ranges are different depending upon the cloud uh, where your customer is homed. So once you configure the SBC, the next thing what you have to do is to actually connect the SBC um, right, you know, to the topology. So Teams is aware that this SBC actually exists, and these are the these are the all, all the parameters associated with that SBC. Then obviously we have to configure voice routing, and at the end of at, at the very end we have to enable users to be able to use this SBC, and then everything is gonna be golden, right? So we did configuration yesterday, the the steps, but let's also kind of make sure at a high level we are um, we are. We are OK, just as you know that SBC vendors have their own documentation. Um, <clears throat> the, the, obviously, the certificate requirements, the, the name requirements are common, but at the end of the day, it, whether it's audio codes, whether it's something else, you kind of have to follow the vendor documentation, get the correct licenses, define the interfaces, the external facing interface, the internal facing interface, get the certificate, specify what is going to be the signaling port and what is going to be the media port, right? Signaling port is going to be, if you go with the default that everyone uses, it's 5061 and media port is 5068. You define the SIP options, that's new. We haven't discussed about SIP options. We are going to talk about that today. And codex that it supports, right? That's going to be what codex it supports. You can't really, you know, add whatever we want, right? So it has to be dependent on the SBC vendor and the model that you are buying, which is going to specify what codex it's going to support. And then we have to set up the routing. So let's first do, let's connect the SBC, right? Because on the service side, and when I say service, I mean on the team's service side, uh, we connect or register the SBC by using a PowerShell commandlet. And you see the PowerShell commandlet on the screen. It's the new CS online PSTN gateway. What this does is that it allows the service, which is team service, to realize the FQDN of the session border controller, right? Because that's how it will then look up on the on, on the DNS zone to say, hey, I'm trying to connect to sbc1.controller.com. And and then it will get the IP. But to know that sbc1.contoso.com is the name of the session border controller, that's what we put it on the new CS online PST and gateway when we are running that command. So basically, it will tell the service the FQDN of the session border controller, the port the session border controller will be listening on, uh, and also um, the maximum concurrent sessions and some of the other SIP options, uh, whether it's enabled or not. So what you see on the screen are some of the parameters that are basic minimum parameters you need to set, right? So over here, you can see that they decided that they're going to do the SIP signaling and the media also is going to be using the same one. So they're just doing 5068 for both. You can absolutely do that. 
So in this case, the SBC is listening on 5068. The max concurrent sessions is set to 50, which is obviously very low. Um, majority of SBCs can support a, a lot more concurrent uh, connections, but this is obviously a test, right? Now, this is not a requirement to put in uh, the max concurrent sessions, but it's a good practice because if you are doing it in a production environment and you have multiple SBCs, you don't want one SBC to be overloaded uh, or actually su supporting and servicing multiple or a lot of concurrent calls with other SBCs are sitting idle, right? So uh, you want to put it in so that you have a proper load balancing between between multiple SBC. And then, of course, one of the things do not forget that you have to make enable in equals true, right? If you don't make enabled equals true, then this SBC is registered, but it's not in service. So you, why do we put this option in again at all is because let's say you actually have uh, you're registering the service. I mean, the, the SBC, but it's not fully ready yet um, to support users. Then you can keep enabled equals false and then turn it enable equals true once everything is ready. Right. Or if you want to say, do, you know, do some maintenance work and stuff like that, you can make enable equals false and do your maintenance and then turn it back on after which it will be able to service, continue to service, uh, you know, in more, more calls sort of new calls going forward. So. And so this slide and I think the next slide is just some of the some of the parameters that you can configure, right? Some are absolutely required. Some are good to have, right? And you can get a whole list uh, by just going into the dock side. So the SIP signaling port, obviously it's absolutely uh, uh, very, very important because that's going to tell us that that's going to tell teams what port the session border controller is going to be listening on for the SIP connections and so it can actually talk to it because do understand that session border controller only talks SIP, right? It doesn't talk MNP24, do understand that. And that's the only time you're going to hear uh, in Teams that we are talking SIP. And then obviously enabled or not, I think that goes without uh, without saying. Then you have two things, right? You have the forward PAI and forward call history. Something important parameters to consider. Forward PAI indicates whether we use the P asserted identity, uh, where the header will be also forwarded along with the call, right? And what that is uh, important for is to provide, is for us to verify the identity of the caller, right? So that's forward uh, PAI and the default is false. So if you do want to use it, you want to make sure you explicitly turn this into, two, into true. Likewise, you can also utilize the forward call history parameter, which will indicate whether the call history information is forwarded through the trunk. So what happens is that if we set this to true, the SIP proxy that we use in the service will actually then send two additional headers, the history info and the referred by. These two additional headers, the SIP proxy that's in the cloud will then send to the SBC, right? So um, that's a, that's important and I think that adds value to uh, to majority of users. Again, these are, these are not enabled by default. So if you want to use this, you need to explicitly set this to true because the default is false. Um, some other ones um, that we use, SIP options enabled, right? This should always be true. And it is true by default because the SIP option is the polling mechanism that we use to ensure that the gateway is still alive. If we turn SIP options off, we don't really, when I say we, Teams doesn't really have a way to monitor and alert whether the SBC has gone offline. So it's always a good idea to keep these enabled. Right, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat it. Right, do not disable it. I don't know whether we even why we give an option to to disable it. The default is true because e there are situations where you know the SBC can just have issues and is not working, and uh, and is not reachable. And if we don't have this turned on to true, then Teams is gonna think that oh this guy doesn't have any sessions even if there are multiple you know SBCs the other SBCs are working but it's gonna continuously keep trying to send it to this SBC which is non-functional at this point. 
So it's like kind of like a keep alive if you if you think about it that way, right? So please don't disable it. Max concurrent session, we already discussed that. Enable fast failover time, right? So um, this is important if your organization have slow networks, right? Because if your organization has slow networks, if you enable fast failover time, then because the network is slow, maybe everything is working just because the network is slow, the amount of time it takes for us to get a response is over 10 seconds. And then we are gonna think, oh, this whole trunk is not available and just go over to the next trunk, which is not the right case, right? So you, you, if you if you have a slow network, then you might want to uh, might want to um, change it to false. And then there's media bypass, right? I think we discussed media bypass in quite some details yesterday. So if unless anyone has questions, uh, you know we will skip again going over media bypass. Scott, if there's any questions in the chat that we need to bring up verbally, please please uh, interject. Andrew Neil, um, one quick question we had was uh, uh, why default value of forward uh, PAI is false? Why false? I don't know. It is by default is false. I don't know, you know why the product team, when they decided how the, the commandlets are going to go, I, I don't know why by default they decided to get it to false. For all my customers that I used to work with, you know, we never had any reason to not make it true. Got it. Thank you. So let's take a look uh, now that we have, you know, made the or not made, uh, configured the SBC, and then we have registered the session border controller. Let's just step all the way through from creating the gateway to create a simple voice routing configuration, right? So one of the first things that we are going to do is to make sure that we that we registered the session border controller, right? Which is using the command that we just saw, new CS online PST and gateways, specifying an FQDN, specifying a SIP signaling port, and we are enabling it to true. And you can see obviously all the other parameters that we just discussed, we are not putting it in, we're just doing simply what you need to do at a bare minimum, right? So now our, our SBC is registered with, with Teams and Teams is happy about it. And then the next thing, as we talked about in our planning session, in order for me to be able to set up my voice routing, what do I need? I need a combination of PST and usages, voice routing policy, and then also voice routes. So in this case, because this is a very basic configuration, let's just create a basic uh, PST and usage. We'll make it global uh, and we will basically, you know, just leave it bare minimum. And to make it very um, confusing, we also decided we decided that we are going to name it unrestricted. But at the end of the day, remember that PST and usages by themselves don't do anything. It's the glue in between that decides, first of all, on one side, if the user is allowed to make this call, right? You remember the class of service and the class of uh, restriction. And then on the other side, if the user is in, indeed allowed to make the call, then it will decide the voice route so that you can figure out which route to take, which SBC to go, how to normalize the phone number, and how to make the call out, right? So PST and usages is right in the middle, connecting both those things together, and both of them has to work. The user has to be in, you know, allowed to make the call, whether it's local, long distance, international, calling Mars or Moon, doesn't matter. Uh, and then the user needs to be able to, we need to be able to normalize the number, have a route uh, that, that, that that specific number pattern and that specific number will be allowed to take and have an uh, uh, up and running SVC from where the call can be then transferred to PSTN. So um, I hope that is that is clear to everyone. If not, we can go over it as many times as needed because that is obviously the whole crux of uh, direct routing, how you how you set it up. So if you have questions, please put it in. We have so many SMEs on the call, you know, um, they can definitely answer. So in this case, this is a simple PSTN usage that we created. Now let's uh, create the, you know, associate that usage with a new voice route. So here you see, I do a new CS online voice route, the name of the route. Again, I'm going to call it unrestricted. And you will see my number pattern here is, what do you see? Dot star, where is my mouse? Yeah, right here. 
Uh, dot star. What does dot star mean? Dot star means that I am going to accept any number. Again, I'm just creating it, keeping it as simple as possible. Uh, why are people pinging me? Um, as simple as possible, and um, I'm going to accept any number, and I'm saying that, okay, whatever number it is, uh, I'm going to send it out to sbc1.controlso.com, and the associated PST usage is unrestricted from here, right? So far, so good. We are taking everything. We are very generous. All numbers are allowed. So the last piece of the puzzle is actually to create the voice routing policy. So oh, come on. So in this case, I am also calling it unrestricted. Everything's unrestricted, right? And I'm just uh, associating it with the online PST in usage of unrestricted, right? So I have everything. I have my PST in usage. I have my voice routing policy. And I have also the associated voice route, and I am good to go. So I have uh, I have um, I have everything that I need for any call that a user. Oh, we have to assign that to the user, right? Uh, that is important, right? We have to assign the policy to the user so that the user uh, has a policy. Because if the user doesn't have a policy, he's not going to be able to make a call, right? All these we are making so that the user can have the policy assigned to them. So after this, the user Spencer Low uh, is able to make any calls, and the call is going to be going out, matching number pattern dot star, and then going out the sbc1.contoso.com that we have defined on step one. Right? Pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at a little bit more advanced. I, I don't see it as an advanced one, but when we were taking the training, this was considered that they were showing it to us, so I'm going to bring it to you also, um, how it looks like, where we have multiple SBCs and where we are deciding, kind of similar to the example that we did yesterday uh, as to how do we route different calls depending upon the number patterns to different SBCs, right? Because yesterday we were not registering the SBC. That's the only difference that we have from yesterday where we are going to be registering the SBCs. So the same thing. Right, like in the last slide, we are going to start by registering the online PST and using the online PST and gateway commandlet. Let's register two SBC, SBC one, SBC two, and their SIP signaling port, and they are both enabled. Because why do I have two SBCs? Just from a redundancy standpoint. You can also create. By the way, you can also create. Um, you can also create an SBC cluster if you want. Then at that point, um, both the SBCs will have a common name in that sense, as you know, like clustering works. And then we will only be registering one, and that's the only one that the 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 the, uh, the, the common name is. That's the only one that's gonna get registered. But then at the end, the cluster is going to then decide which SBC and how to do the failover or load balancing, etc. Or you can just leave it the way that you see in here. So next, let's create the PST and usage, right? This time, I'm going to be creating two separate usages. Now, I'm going to be uh, making one for US and Canada, right? So that's the one that I want my calls for US and Canada to go out uh, SBC1 and SBC2. Now, again, um, as I mentioned, you know, I keep mentioning that this PST and usage by itself doesn't do anything because at this point, it's not really tied to anything. It's not really tied to a voice routing policy or a voice route. So it's not tied to the user. It's not tied to the gateway. It's just a PST in usage that we have just defined. So let's build out our voice routes. For the first voice route, we are going to do two specific ones, as you can see on the screen, plus 1425 and plus 1206. These are the Redmond and Seattle numbers. There's my voice route, right? So I am specifying for folks who were on our session yesterday. This is uh, 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 the normalization rule, which says that I am going to be accepting any any number digit that a user is dialing, as long as it starts with plus one four two five followed by seven digits, or plus one two zero six followed by seven digits. And then I'm saying that that needs to get uh, the, the 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 actual SBCs are going to be SBC one and SBC2, right? So now let's also have, um, let's also add two more SBCs in here, right? SBC3 and SBC4, right? 
that so now I have two more SBCs that I have land that I've added into the service. And let's define two more um, two new sets of routes, right? Let's call it Redmond two. Um, now let's why is this not moving? Okay, so you see two and both of them has that same four two five and two zero six. What is the difference? Is that one has a priority one, one has a priority two. What does that mean? We will discuss that uh, briefly. So you can now see compared to the voice route that we defined last time on the simple one, we have now added and we were using priority one, I think on that one also, even if there are no other priorities, but this time we have added priority two. Um, and then both of them are using the same online PST usage of US and Canada, right? So we created two voice routes, one priority one, one priority two, the same number pattern is going to allow both of them are connecting to the same PST usage. At the end of the day, what we are trying to do is that we are expecting, let's say we meaning the customer is expecting there's going to be an enormous number of calls to 425 and 206 numbers, and they want SBC 1 and 2 to be taking all of them. If only SBC 1 or 2, both are not available, then they want SBC 3 and 4, which are the backups to come in, and that that logic is going to get implemented with priority one and priority two. Priority two will only come in if priority one is uh, not not available. So uh, let's add two more session border controllers. That's SBC five and SBC six. And um, let's let's create uh, our, our new uh, voice route, which is basically all other ten digit numbers, right? Um, you know, as you can see, plus one followed by 10 digits, and it's a priority three. So what we are now doing with this new voice route, we are saying, and that's a priority three. If anyone's calling 425206, it should always go SBC1, SBC2. If SBC1 or 2 is not available, then it goes to SBC3, SBC4. If anyone calls my cell phone number, which is one, two, or three followed by seven digits, None of these number patterns match. So by default, it's going to go to this new one that I just created at the end, and it's always going to so go out SBC5, SBC6. So basically, any number that does that is uh, US and Canada number and doesn't uh, match or doesn't start with 1425 or 1206 is going to go out SBC5, SBC6, right? So once that is done, I am um, going to be, you know, obviously I need the uh, voice routing policy. Again, the class of service, class of restriction to define that. And then I just have to um, assign that policy to that specific user. Right. So any question? Right. So as you can see, only one voice routing policy is absolutely fine because that def defines if the user is allowed to make the call. Uh, in our case, we are not restricting anyone from calling to, to, if, if the restriction was that you know only some people are allowed to call you know rest of the us uh, others are only allowed to call four to five and two or six then we'll have uh, uh, two voice routing policies for the two different sets of users in our case all users are allowed to call all of us and canada is just with, so we have only one voice routing policy, uh, and then um, we are defining the different SBCs by using the different voice routes that we have created. Questions from anyone? I guess not. Okay. Well, actually, it looks like uh, Alfred or Alfred has a question. Let me. Okay. Go ahead, Alfred. Feel free to unmute. Okay, uh, I have questions regarding your uh, voice route. You define so first you define the uh, priority one, then priority two, the last one uh, you define priority three. Let's uh, go back that uh, the last one I define as a uh, priority one, and then the first one um, Redmond one I define priority two, and the uh, Redmond two I define priority uh, three. Mm -hmm. So in that case, if I dial some uh, number like four uh, one four two five or two o six, where I the uh, where I the match the last one or match the, the I mean match the last one uh, priority one or yeah, no no oh great question uh, it, it will be so what you are saying 
if I understood you, you, Alfred, is that you are you are asking this made this be made priority one, and in in a situation this is actually priority one, and this is priority two, priority three, and if yeah. someone dial four to five, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that we are going to go through the priorities, and one four to five and seven digit, this is going to match, right? So it's going to go yeah. out to SBC five and six, and not go out through what the customer wanted, which is SBC one and two. So it's uh, it's do not uh, care about is more specific. No, nope. that's right. why we have the priority ones. Right? If it matches, that's it. I'm not evaluating anything else. Okay, gotcha. Cool, cool. Great question. Thank you. Any other questions, Ash? That's on the chat or something that we can bring up. Um, looks like Aditya had a quick question. Uh, Aditya, do you want to uh, get off mute and uh, ask real quick? Uh, Sharan. Okay. Hello. Oh. Yeah, actually, my question was uh, regarding the incoming call from the PSTN. Okay. So in that scenario, if uh, like a uh, call is coming with G729 codec, okay, and uh, suppose Teams is not accepting that, then uh, who is in the media bypass uh, scenario? Then who's going to like transcode that particular thing? Is it going to be the SBC or? Is it going to be the media processor? Because it's as you said yesterday, that, that everything will be transporting by media processor. So in this scenario is also be it's media processor. It's going to be the SBC. We, this we is going to the SBC. have it how to transcode the, the licensed one. Okay. okay. So there are scenarios. They're absolutely right. Thanks for mentioning it. And uh, uh, that there are some scenarios very limited where the SBC will have to do the transcoding. And that is actually common in the sense if you are doing it with the PBX, where a lot of PBXs does 729, um, that um, e either the, the, the PBX will have to do the transcoding or the SBC will have to do the transcoding. All right. Okay, thank you. Great questions. Let's uh, move on to the, the next slide. Um, so, you know, we talked about dial plan, right? Yesterday, and we talked about service country dial plan. We talked about global dial plan, and we talked about uh, user dial plan. And so, what you see over here is just the base normalization rules, right? Uh, because every every country, every user, when we create and assign the user a country, then they automatically get the service country dial plan, which you cannot change. So as I was mentioning yesterday, this is the one for US. You can see it allows you by default so that you don't have to do anything. Um, we are saying how to you know, capture international dialing, which is from the US, 011, excuse me. And then we are doing some extension ones. How do you do long distance, which is one plus, it should be 10 digits and oh, there it is. Uh, we are doing the, the United States 10 digits. So you can see with the service country dial plan, and if you have, if the user is in India, if the user is in South Africa, like if you assign the user and then go in and see um, the, the dial plan, you will see what is the country specific dial plan that Microsoft already creates and assigns uh, depending upon the country uh, that the user is assigned to. And then obviously you can create your own. And then, as I mentioned yesterday, unlike Skype for Business, where we have a priority order in this case, uh, if you create anything extra, it will get merged, and then the user will have one merged dial plan. But I can tell you in majority of cases, try to not have anything extra, um, at least specifically in the, in the US, because of the fact that we are trying to move people away from digit dialing to name dialing, right? We discussed that yesterday so that people don't have to remember that I have to dial three digits for Boston and then dial five digits of the extension for this specific user. All of those, if we bring those, I hate to use the word, but if we bring those additional complexity or, or gar, not, gar, I shouldn't say garbage, but additional complexity and try to provide that in teams, it's just we are gonna make the area more complicated. In majority, majority of cases, to be honest, and I've worked on many complicated ones, you are absolutely good with just what you have on the service country dial plan. 
If you absolutely need something, maybe one, maybe two. That's that any other custom. If you have 10 dial plans, custom ones, there's something wrong that we are doing possibly. All right, so let's talk about something very interesting called local media optimization. What does that mean? So local media optimization uh, is a feature uh, within Microsoft Teams that enables organizations to keep your media, which is your voice traffic, not video, right? Let's make sure, right? That's why when I don't like the word media because media can be video. So think about it allows you to keep your voice traffic in PST and calls localized to a private connection between the session border controller and the team's client without having to traverse the internet to Microsoft, you know, through to the Microsoft service. So why is this important? Because that optimization means that the media makes you know, fewer hops, it travels for less distance, and obviously when you have fewer hops, you're traveling less distance, you have less quality issues and less security concerns. So, so that's local media optimization. Some people might be thinking is that, how is that different from media bypass? Right, which we which we discussed in detail yesterday. So there are actually a couple, uh, you know, key differences between you know local media optimization and media bypass. So when we are doing media bypass, media bypass uh, can only connect the team's client to the SBCs. Um, so uh, let me let me take a step back. Yesterday we uh, we discussed that you know. If the user is internal and the SBC is also internal in inside of the customer's network, when I want to connect the media, it has to hair pin out and then come back in to the external IP address of the SBC. That is that, that is the recommended one, but if you actually want you and your SBC supports it, you can actually have your internal user connect directly to the internal IP address of the SBC, right? Uh, if you are doing, um, so if you are doing media bypass, you have to connect it to the external IP, but with local media optimization, if it's set up, then your team's client can access both the external IP and the internal IP of the SBC. Let me repeat what I said. I know I, I'm, I, I'm sure I confused a few people. So what I mean by that, let me let me draw. Well, let me get a. What is a good drawing thing? Or I'm just going to draw it here. One second. So what I mean by that is that um, let's say this is my in, uh, external firewall, and let's not worry about a DMZ, right? Or let's do a DMZ. So let's say this is the DMZ. And this is our internal firewall, and this is my user, and this is my SBC. Right? So, and this is the, the, the cloud, this is the Microsoft Cloud, this is Teams. Teams. <laughs> it looks like anything besides Teams, but anyhow, right? You guys get the point. So what I what we discussed yesterday that for a user and there this has an external facing IP and then you have an internal facing IP, then uh, this connects to PSTN, right? Now there is uh, uh, you can and it's recommended that you actually NAT it, right? So for folks who don't know what a NAT is, it's a network address translation, so that you are not publishing this IP address to uh, the rest of the world. There is, a, there is a different IP address that's in here, and then there is this firewall is going to maintain the state and then disconnect this and then recreate a brand new session between the two that then comes through here. Right, that's just a normal, very common security uh, protection that we have, which is NATI. So going back to our discussion, when you have media bypass on and just media bypass and not local media optimization, then 
for an external user, for a for a for a user sitting on the internet, you know what we discussed yesterday. I'm just going through it. The external user, when he needs to do the media, he can connect to this external IP, and then he will through the netting, he will then come over here, and then the media will go out. And we discussed yesterday if this is not allowed for any IP to connect to this public IP and come back in. What is he going to do? He's going to go to the transport relay and the transport relay is allowed and then it will come back here and then the media is going to flow. Hopefully so far everyone's good, at least for folks who attended yesterday's session. For internal folks, we mentioned that you cannot connect, even if both are inside, you cannot connect to the SBC directly because for media bypass, you will actually have to hair pin out and come back into that external IP address. So meaning your egress IP in here has to be allowed on the firewall to be able to come back in. So that's for media bypass. With local media optimization, if you enable local media optimization, then this same team's client can actually access both the external IP and also the internal IP. Right, so he doesn't have to go out externally and come back in. So why is this really um, so, so why is this helpful? Because now that means internal media traffic for folks who are internal can be kept entirely within your organization internal network without traversing you know, the internet and all the firewalls and the net, right? Because local media optimization allows uh, and allows teams to identify whether a user is internal within the network or whether the user is sitting outside. Because if this user is sitting outside, obviously he can't connect inside. So he will automatically either come through here, either be allowed depending upon the firewall setup or will get redirected through the transport relay. But he will be at least come coming through this, this area. But now with local media optimization, teams will identify that this user is local, connecting from local internal network and will actually allow it to go to the internal uh, IP of the SBC. Uh, this diagram, uh, hopefully that, that made sense. If not, please again put it on the chat. So let me erase this. So let's see, you know, what are some situations where local media optimization can be really, really helpful, right? So let's take a look at Contoso, right? So let's say Contoso uh, has, um, and that's the, what this example does. It has, you know, a lot of offices in Europe. Contoso has a lot of offices and each offices has their own PBX. But now they're looking to centralize it, right? Because having 50, you know, PBXs in 50 locations requires a lot of maintenance, management, upgrade cost, everything else. So they're saying, uh, I have good connection. I have really good connection between all the different sites coming to my hub site. Let's call it Paris or what, what do we have? What do I have here? Amsterdam. Let's call Amsterdam is my is my hub site. There's enough bandwidth to support what is required to for all of the European users. So they're like, I'm going to get rid of all the SBCs and I'm just going to keep one, uh, which is basically called centralizing the SBC. And I'm, that's going to be in Amsterdam in this situation. Then all other PBXs are gone. So now once that is set up, in this model, let's take a look from a local media optimization how the traffic is going to work. So this one's very straightforward, very simple, right? It's um, so what you can see, we have the signaling channel. There is only one SBC that got registered with the new CS online PST and gateway command lead. Yes, and that got registered with Teams. Uh, obviously, the SBC has a connection to the PST and network. So uh, user sitting external, he or she wants to make a phone call to a PST and user. The signaling stays always the same. Signaling always goes to Teams and Teams will you know, initiate it with the SBC using the SIP proxy, right? Because we only talk SIP with, with the SBC and then it will provide this user to say, OK, your media uh, is going to now go directly and again, if allowed, let's not complicate it. Let's say in the firewall in here, it is allowed. Uh, if not, again, it will go through the transport relay. 
But if if it is allowed, let's say, then he's going to go directly from here to the SBC, and then from the SBC, the media is going to go to ESTN. Doesn't matter if the user is external German user, external like France user who is sitting outside, or Amsterdam user who is sitting outside. The the um, the, uh, the the process is going to be the same user to SBC external IP and then the SBC is going to send it to PSTN. Now, if the user is sitting internal, doesn't matter France, Amsterdam or Germany, again, the signaling always is maintained with Teams. And then because it's local media optimization, Teams will now tell this user for your actual media, send it to the internal IP address of the, of the SBC and then it will go out. So now what we are doing, and that is the whole idea, one of the primary idea of local media optimization is to keep calls localized as much as possible so that I am not going out to the internet. I am not going to now get redirected or need the requirement of transport relay to reflect my data back in. I can keep my data internal so now that the user will be able to connect to the internal IP address of that SBC and that uh, call will go. Same with France users, internal IP address. Same with Amsterdam users who is going to connect to the internal IP and the call will then go to PSTN, right? That is called the centralized SBC model with local media optimization. OK, all right. So now let's talk about a, a new scenario, which is called proxy SBCs and downstream SBCs. So there are a lot of time, um, and in this example, we'll take this example that we have. Uh, we are building a solution where uh, traditionally they have PSTN services coming to, you know, uh, maybe they have TDM uh, or whatnot, but they're coming to Vietnam from from PSTN network to Vietnam to their PBX in Vietnam, uh, PSTN network to their PBX in Indonesia, PSTN network to their PBX in Singapore, right? Let's say these are the three places. Now I want to get rid of all the PBXs. I want to have, um, you know, I, I don't want the PBXs in there, but I want to keep the things localized. My users are moving to Teams. They're not going to be on the hard phones anymore. What are my options to keep my my traffic localized? So now what and then then the scenario is that these sites maybe they're using a TDM, right? So I can't I can't use uh, um, what is the word? I can't use um, uh, so I can't basically. Uh, whether whether they're using TDM, I'm forgetting the other example. Whether they're using TDM or let's say more more common is that they might not have any more any public IP addresses. They were used to they are very small sites. They were used to utilize Singapore for all their say IP needs like going to Internet, going to Microsoft, going to Office 365. They were all using uh, Singapore's you know egress point to go out to the cloud. But so they don't have any public IP addresses. Only thing that they had coming from the outside was a TDM trunk and to give them voice. So they want to continue having that, like that I want to be able to utilize voice without having to go back to the cloud, but I don't have a public IP address. Now you can say that why are they not centralizing it, right? Why are they not sending everything to Singapore, like the previous example where we are sending everything through, through uh, Amsterdam, is because a lot of countries have their requirements uh, where you will have to have uh, a physical phone call uh, basically get to PSTN from that local region. Meaning Vietnam users making a phone call to PSTN, that phone call has to connect to PSTN in Vietnam itself. It can't connect to Singapore uh, and uh, it can't connect to PSTN network from Singapore. It's a legal requirement to connect from that country, right? So whatever the situation is, uh, but that is what we are trying to solve. So in this case, because we don't have another SBC which has a public IP address, I can't register it like a normal SBC in Teams. Because for normal SBC in Teams, Teams needs to connect to it over SIP, over this green line, which I can do it for Singapore because that has a public IP address. But because the VN SBC, Vietnam SBC, or Indonesia, 
Asia ID as we see, uh, they don't have a public IP address. So I can't connect to it directly. Right, you guys get the point. Right, so what are my options? Let me move these. My options is to create this new uh, setup, which is called the proxy SBC and a downstream SBC. So the proxy SBC, so we, basically we are creating a, 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 an architecture of multiple SBCs, whereas one SBC has a public IP address. In this case, this is the one in Singapore, and in, it's called the proxy SBC, and we have also given it the name of proxy SBC. You can obviously call it anything that you want. But from team standpoint, that is called a proxy SBC. And then these are called the downstream SBCs. And the downstream SBCs have no requirement to have a public IP address. But they can be defined, they can be assigned voice routes. So they be, I can assign to Vietnam that calls hitting you, you need to send it over this trunk. Calls hitting you, you can send it to this trunk to PSTN, right? So I can assign voice routes to each of these SBCs, but even if they don't have a, a public IP address. So how Andrew, does, Andrew, no, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just a time check for you. You've got about 20 minutes in this session left. OK, yeah, that's actually good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Otherwise, I will, I will continue for the whole day. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, so uh, let's take a look at the external, like the media flow for external and internal users. So for external users, right, um, <clears throat> the call is going to, doesn't matter who the user is, right? If the user is in Singapore, if the, if the user is Vietnam user, Indonesia user, if the user is external, then it, it doesn't really, um, I mean, we can still actually make it where, and I will show you the, the command that you have to do, but you know, the user makes the call. Let's say this is a Vietnam user. The Vietnam user makes the call. He can only connect over the public IP address, which is goes to Singapore, because the only connection with external for the media is via Singapore. So I connect to Singapore, and then Singapore will then give the media to Vietnam, and then Vietnam will then the Vietnam SBC will then connect to PSTN from Vietnam. So if the same Vietnam user is sitting at office or sitting at home because he's a Vietnam Vietnam user, his call will hit the PSTN network from within Vietnam itself. Right? Same thing with Indonesia and whatnot. So that's external. The internal ones are also uh, pretty straightforward at that time. Obviously, the signal is managed with teams, um, like the way we normally will do. But then when the user a Vietnam user makes the call, then the call is going to stay localized because that's the whole idea about local media optimization to keep it localized. So the actual media is going to go from here to its own internal, um, the internal IP address of its own SBC, and then the call is going to go out to PSTN. If it's a Singapore user, he makes the call, he's sitting in an office location, his call is going to go to the internal IP address and then go out to PSTN. Same thing with Indonesia. Now, one of the other things that you can also do, I want to mention, is that you can also set up a, a bypass mode. There are two options. One is called always bypass. One is called always only for local users. So always bypass means that if, let's say, Indonesia, you know what? No, don't worry about it. I don't want to confuse it, right? Let's just understand from a local media optimization uh, how it works, specifically with a proxy SBC and a downstream SBC, right? And specifically where you do not have a public IP address that you can assign to that SBC. I know you might be thinking that how, why we did not have a public IP address and everything else, but that is actually quite common and also legal requirements of making sure that your PSTN, um, you hit your PSTN from within the local region is also quite common. So um, local media optimization is actually quite widely used in a lot of customer deployments. So if you have any questions, please put it on the chat. Um, but in the interest of time, I will move on. And this is just showing how you set up, right? because you have to first specify what is the trusted IP address, right? Trusted IP address meaning what is the public IP address that is in here? 
the public IP address that I can see and teams can see that I can connect. So it is the public IP address. Please, it's not the IP address inside. It is the public facing IP address. So you define all the public IP addresses. And then what you do is you define, you have to define some of the other network elements, which we will be using here. We can also use, we will also use it when we do 911. You define the region, you define the site, you define the subnets. So the site and subnets, if anyone is new to it, these, 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 these are network sites. These are network sites that you define within teams, right? So these are not network sites that your, your network team has defined. This is something that you are defining from within teams. This is a, 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 a logical name because at the end of the day, a subnet is just a collection of, I'm sorry, a site is just a collection of subnets. So as you can see over here, Vietnam has one subnet in our example. And so this subnet is, is associated with Vietnam. You can see that this is how I am associated. So I'm creating a network site ID, a network site named Vietnam, which is part of the network region of APAC. And then what constitutes, how do I know that a user is coming in from a network site ID of Vietnam by the associated sub, uh, subnet that is associated. So if the user is coming in from 192.168.1.11, I will know that the user is coming in from Vietnam. So you first define these, these uh, network elements in that sense, and then you basically go ahead and define the SBCs. And as you can see, unlike a normal CS online PSTN gateway commandlet that we have been doing over here, we are actually uh, um, specifying this one. I can, I'm specifying just as a normal one. But then the downstream SBCs, I am adding another parameter, which is the most important parameter, which defines what is my upstream SBC, meaning what is the SBC that actually has the public IP address. So I am adding another parameter of proxy SBC, and then whatever the name of the proxy SBC is, right? We should have named it something different to not make people confused, but that is the whole idea. So once I specify hyphen proxy SBC and then define what is the proxy SBC, you know, FQDN, now this one VN SBC is the downstream SBC of this upstream SBC. Same thing with Indonesia, you know, I am defining hyphen proxy SBC parameter associating it with the actual proxy SBC, and we are good to go. And that is it. That's all what we have to do when it comes to uh, local media uh, optimization. So, uh, that's all right. So let's talk about management, right? This is very, very, uh, very simple. Uh, obviously, when it comes to management, once you have, uh, once you have, now that you have deployed direct routing, you know, your call, if someone is complaining about a bad call, you, you can have the issue in multiple areas, right? You can have the issue in teams. You can have the issue as a, as a problem in the session water controller. If there is a PBX users involved, you can have the issue in PBX. You can also have an issue in PST and maybe your you know, command office have some problems, right? So at the end of the day, when you are trying to trying to you know troubleshoot, you kind of have to have folks from all the ones to kind of help you, depending upon what type of problem you are having. With Teams, um, Ash and Scott are going to cover tomorrow call, um, call quality dashboard or um, uh, what is the other one? Um, call analytics, where you can actually go and see near real time and it will tell you where the problem might be. But at the end of the day, you can only so much visibility into the PBX, so you'll have to have them come in. If you are not the one managing the session border controller is hosted, then you will need to have them come in um, so that you know you can make a look. A lot of times I have seen being part of a lot of troubleshooting, the Teams is not getting, for example, you know the right refer or the right response back from the session border controller, right? So a lot majority of the time in my example, the the issue is uh, with the setup between the session border controller and teams. So you definitely, if it's not managed by you, you will then have to bring in the hosted service folks to to kind of help you uh, troubleshoot a, a bad call.
Uh, there are health dashboard. This one I want to uh, spend 30 seconds. Uh, it, this basically shows you all, all what's happening with all your SBCs, right? Uh, which SBC is active, which SBC is inactive, which SBC has some, you can see SIP options, uh, has some warnings, you know, obviously we would want to know what they are. If it's inactive, meaning they are just not accessible, right? Obviously this is not a good scenario, right? I don't see anything that is working or maybe this is the only thing that is working as expected, right? You don't want to do that. So, but at least it gives you an overview as to what teams see, what is the status of, uh, of uh, the SBCs in your environment. And then you can kind of see, um, you know, what's happening with the individual SBC. When did it last connect with TLS? Am I getting and receiving all the options properly? What is my network effectiveness ratio? What is the average call duration and so forth? So a lot of good telemetry you can get by clicking on each individual SBC to kind of look into a little bit more details. The last slide just talks about some common SBC configuration issues, right? Uh, that if you are setting up an SBC and you are you trying to make a call and it's not working, and then Teams you see some of these options, uh, some of these errors, then these are common ones, and um, uh, we just added it so that it helps in case it 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 it, it you know in case it's helpful. Uh, so, for example, you know, very this is so simple, right? The certificate that the SBC has maybe doesn't have the proper proper chain, right? So we are not even authenticating over TLS, so we can't trust the SBC, so teams can't talk to it, right? That's a very simple one. What about uh, 404 not found? This is for an incoming call. When I get a 404 not count from the SBC, then then basically says that uh, this this user is not set up properly. Right, the phone number, maybe there's a phone number mismatch and I can't, the SBC can't actually find a user with that number, right? Or you are connecting, but there are no audio, right? And this is very common that it connects, you hear a ring and then it drops. There are some netting issues, which is on the firewall because normally if the SBC is home, home in, inside your environment, there are two firewalls that is, that is uh, traversing the external firewall and the internal firewall of the DMZ. Right, so different things, uh, and then if it's more complicated, you'll possibly have to bring Microsoft in. You have to bring experts on the SBC side, 